Hello and welcome to a special edition of uh, E Expressions of the New Indian Express. I have with me four gentlemen who know exactly what was happening when India seemed to be not moving at all. Uh, they were uh, the people who were sort of oiling the wheels and making India move uh, against uh, enormous odds uh, and keeping uh, the lifelines of India going. Uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to uh, introduce all of them and my um, uh, editorial director, Mr. Prabhu Chavla. Uh, welcome. Uh, there's Mr. Vini, Vini Thagarwal. He's the ASA champ president as well as the MD, the Transport Corporation of India. Mr. Kalsi, executive board member, Maruti. Mr. Sukanta Das, chief logistics officer, Hindalco uh, Industries. And Mr. Sri Hari Echarapu, he's uh, the CEO of Cargo Exchange. And Mr. Chavla, as I said. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, this is an industry that has seen an enormous growth uh, in the last, um, uh, um, you know, 18 months. Uh, at least it's under enormous focus and uh, one of the few industries that seems to have uh, survived uh, the general uh, slowdown in the economy. Uh, so, gentlemen, I'd like to begin with Mr. Agarwal, if I may, right away and really talk about this new normal world that we're living in and how does he see the growth for logistics service providers and warehouse service providers in this extremely challenging environment? Um, thank you, Kaveri. Thank you, Mr. Chavla. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, this is an exciting session because we're going to talk about a lot of areas uh, related to logistics and essentially, as you rightly said, the wheels of the economy. Uh, even during the pandemic and at the pan as we go through the pandemic, the most important uh, source of real, I would say, comfort also other than the medical fraternity has been the fact that you are able to get everything to the medical fraternity or to your homes uh, or to uh, shops, etc. I think... Uh, the, the fact that a lot of the service providers in the logistics space have really put up a brave front to go out during the, the peak, uh, during uh, the time in March, April last year, when no one really knew what was happening. But uh, they braved it out in the front. They made deliveries to our homes uh, and they have uh, really stood up as the COVID warriors uh, of our country. So the, the fact is that there is a major disruption that's happening because of the pandemic, whether it is not uh, just in the uh, regular industries, but also in our industry, which is the logistics and supply chain industry. Uh, there is a shift towards omni-channel, for example, people not just buying from stores, but also from uh, online commerce or going back to stores when uh, lockdowns open. Uh, to the fact that uh, supply chains are becoming uh, a lot more domestic or perhaps uh, they want to reduce the, the kind of the pressure that used to be there. Nobody wants to lose sales. So which meant that uh, companies have to change the way that they're looking at their inventory, for example. And also the, the fact that when you had uh, issues with road transport, other modes of transport picked up, uh, rail picked up, uh, coastal shipping picked up. So these are, uh, are far reaching and dramatic changes that have started to happen because of the changes to industry to the logistics industry as well. And uh, all the service providers have gone through challenging times. Some of them continue to go through challenging times, but the opportunity, the, the fact that there is a growth that's in the inherent growth opportunity in India is massive and that uh, will drive this industry forward as well. Absolutely. Mr. Agarwal, you, you said it right that, you know, they were the silent and all of you really were the silent heroes during this time. I mean, when people were so scared, uh, uh, you know, of what was happening, uh, we saw uh, the logistics chain, the, where, the warehousing, uh, uh, you know, institutions as well. Uh, doing their best to keep everything going. Uh, Mr. Kalsi, may I bring you in here and talk about the state of uh, the uh, logistics and supply chain in this uh, post-pandemic world? Uh, how do you see it? And uh, what really is happening to the global uh, supply chain, specifically, I believe, due to the shortage of microchips? Uh, this pandemic... Uh you know, brought in new challenges. And at the same time, those challenges 
brought some new opportunities as well because certain things uh, we had to do under compulsion which otherwise would have taken a longer time to actually adopt and uh, there were certain things which in the course of uh, routine uh, we followed uh, now here the point was that uh, the f- first uh, you know uh, phenomena that we observed was that uh, from the government side there was a very fast response uh, when the you know lockdowns were there and uh, fleets were moving uh, or they were allowed to move uh, on road and if there were any issues arising there during that time uh, we could immediately you know get those issues uh, resolved uh, th- that that is one thing and uh, second thing is uh, uh, you know uh, when we talk about say uh global impact uh, then there were certain ports which were closed and still there are certain ports which are uh, closed so there was huge congestion uh, on these ports some of the uh, ports you know uh, were totally closed some were operating partially and also because of this the containers were held up at uh, various uh, you know locations and uh, as a result of this there is a great shortage of containers even now and uh, what we are facing today is an increase in the freight rates of uh, say sea shipments uh, also there are delays in terms of uh, say movement of uh, these uh, cargoes uh, or from the sea uh, routes so this is one major challenge uh, which uh, we are facing uh, post uh, pandemic uh, and also you know uh, uh, one more thing i would like to say here is that uh, consumer goods and retail market uh this was uh, this is almost you know half of the size of total uh, logistics market now this got a big boost uh because you know uh, people were not uh, allowed to move or they were not moving because of lockdowns so movement of uh, these goods uh, was very very important uh, particularly the consumer uh, goods uh, even consumer durables and the doorstep delivery uh, which led to you know invent of say uh last minute uh, uh, you know logistics uh, movement so there has been a boom in that as well and i think moving forward that is going to continue and uh, also it has generated uh, you know new avenues uh, for uh, employment of the people who are associated uh, with these uh, last mile uh, deliveries and uh, also there has been a huge emphasis on the uh, say omni channel logistics as uh, mr vinith also mentioned Uh, there has been a focus on cold chains as the medical uh, you know equipments medical medicines injections etc had to be moved uh, at a certain temperature only similarly fu- fruits vegetables so even even for the cold chains uh, it it has been a you know a big opportunity uh, to you know fructify and uh, moving forward i think cold chains which was a weak area for us uh, that that will also get a good momentum so these are some of the you know areas which uh, immediately on the top of mind i can say that post pandemic there would be these uh, changes in the logistics uh, uh, environment absolutely mr das may i bring you in here and talk about really uh, uh, just taking forward what uh, mr kalsi talked about the rise in costs uh, you've seen that uh, and of, of course also the spread uh, the last mile connectivity also meant uh, uh, you know going deeper into tier 2 tier 3 cities uh where perhaps uh, expansion had not taken place uh and this not only meant uh, huge opportunities in terms of employment and uh, which uh, increasingly we'll also have to look at reskilling of people to uh, take care of that but also as mr kalsi said the whole idea of the coal chain which which is quite uh, a, a, a you know an area of concern in india how do you see uh, uh, the challenges as well as the opportunities well i think uh, in terms of our type of industry which is metals and manufacturing yeah. particularly not impacted like any other industry during the pandemic one uh, the demand side was uh, uh because of the economy and on the the supply side uh with suppliers shutting shop uh but the biggest problem was that being a part of the continuous process industry we keep our uh, refineries and smelters running throughout so which meant that we not only had to fed the basic raw materials to the factories but also had to evacuate all the produce right and that any which ways our factories if you know are remotely located which are more nearer to uh, the refine uh, uh, near the min, uh, the mines so uh, any which way it's a complex operation there 
but with the lockdown in place it became a logistical nightmare per se hmm. so what did we do uh, on the supply side we tried to diversify as well as localize our suppliers uh, and on the logistics side at ndalco we uh, anyway use a variety of transport solutions hmm. like we have long distance conveyor belts we have rope ways apart these are internal to us and then external of course the railways and the road network apart from the coastal movement as well so what we did during the pandemic was we continued to evaluate and utilize the best available modes and uh, we made maximum use of railways uh, in fact uh, during the peak uh, lockdown uh, we kind of used 100% of railways to evacuate our stuff uh, and post uh, the initial phase of lockdown we slowly went back uh, to road movements Uh, for the shorter hauls and the last mile which you mentioned our warehouses also were able to come back to full scale capacity and operations after a brief period of stoppage uh, what we leveraged big time during this pandemic was our digital technologies mm. uh, like the ts the iots of the world to gain greater visibility because that was the need of the hour uh, also using our own logistics control tower which we are able to analyze various insights in terms of performance and cost metrics i would say so while the external environment was tough uh, with operational challenges like movement restrictions and commercial challenges uh, like mr kalsi mentioned about the shipping freights going up so what we did was we kept looking inside and we also tried to redesign and uh, uh, kind of our processes and tweak our processes uh, in order to bring the operational efficiency as we speak we were able to reduce our spends uh, on uh, demerges and detention uh, to the score of 50 to 80% uh, but the biggest uh, achievement i would say during that pandemic was to be able to ensure the seamless production uh, across all our uh, factories and also achieve a higher amount of exports for us Oh really? That that's a wonderful thing. Uh, how did you manage the exports, the the transportation of the exports? So as I said, most of our factories, since they are located in the interiors, we had developed our own railway sidings for ourselves. Okay. So all uh, exports are factory stuffed and moves to the ports directly by rail network. So that was taken care by the railways. and then on the ocean side yes in certain cases we did have to pay higher freights but then we were eventually able to evacuate those from the ports as well right so that's marvelous i think you know uh, opportunity in adversity is one of uh, the greatest skills uh, that allows businesses to repivot actually reenergize themselves so you seem to have done that really well may i bring in uh, mr srihari acharyapu because i think we're looking at technological innovations and cargo exchange seems to specialize in them what really were the innovations that you were able to bring about that you're particularly uh, uh, delighted about in a very difficult time thank you ma'am uh, see i just want to speak about like uh, uh, because the uh, as mr das and mr kalsi and mr agarwal has mentioned Uh, the industry was uh, going through tough times actually and right. Was, right and there was a de- huge pending uh, digital disruption which was pending since long time in logistic industry whereas banking insurance every other sector were able to adopt whereas logistic industry it took some time why yeah. is that uh, sorry if i may ask uh, so uh, it was like the age old uh, uh, traditional erps or the companies were using and there were like a, a more dependency on the people the digital uh, disruption didn't happen to much scale uh, like pre like 2015 the whole disruption started uh, around 2015 and uh, the digital solutions started picked up and especially like major clusters like uh, uh, digital lsp started coming up in the uh, industry like uh, robotic warehouse automation started uh, for uh, smart picking and storage solutions uh, next gen uh, asset management solutions started coming up with respect to iot control tower solutions all the data analytics for better decision making with respect to predictive and prescriptive analysis right so those kind of things has started uh, the disruption in this particular industry and uh, uh, it was about to uh, disrupt but at the same time covid also came and uh, actually that it actually in the accelerated the whole process hmm. like uh, like like maybe a 2 to 3 years faster than what it was expected here hmm. 
So I'll tell like one of the example is saying that uh, in terms of digital transformation. So we were like uh, uh, working with government of India for oxygen digital tracking system during the second wave of uh, uh, this COVID nineteen actually during the month of April to June actually. Right. So all of the sudden, what happened? The spike happened from uh, movement of uh, oxygen happened from nine hundred metric ton to nine thousand metric ton, mm. and uh, this scale has to be managed. And right. without digital solution, the scale cannot be managed actually. Right. So that's where uh, Carve Exchange actually has uh, provided a complete transformation with our advisory solutions as well as our technology solutions. So we aggregated, we put a hyper uh, hyper agile methodology, and we aggregated all our microservices, and we are able to like pull the tracking of uh, means the optimization of routes and um, allocation of oxygen to various uh, uh, states, and then how actually the oxygen moves from point A to point B with the real time tracking. So this actually helped, and uh, within five. Uh, uh, sorry, if I, yeah. If I may just interrupt here, uh, with whom did you uh, coordinate in the government specifically? Was there a task force for this? Yes, there was an empowered group too, which was okay. under uh, uh, Ministry of Road Transport Highways and uh, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Okay, so uh, they were telling you where there were extreme shortages, and you were able to pivot the supply to those areas. Absolutely. So the allocation is to come from their end, and we used to like uh, kind of move the trucks wherever required, because uh, at that time the trucks were moving very sporadic. Like uh, uh, some tra trucks are moving by train, some are coming by back by airplane, and uh, the things has to be properly structured. So right. everything was tracked, and 100% we brought it online uh, using digital transformation uh, within like five days for them. Right, but of course there was still so much of a gap uh, in the supply. Absolutely. So we were doing for the liquid oxygen. So again, we need to like plan for the uh, at a cylinder level also actually. This right, right, right. So uh, uh, now can that same technology be also be used to uh, ensure that the vaccine goes to the last man or last woman standing in India? Absolutely. So that is the whole idea. So including like the cold chain solution, which will move from uh, move the vaccine right from the production center uh, to the distribution centers, so like uh, the major hospitals, and to the last mile of that particular thing. Everything can be traced. Even like solutions like blockchain has come up, which can record each and every step. What is the temperature the vaccine has been maintained, and what temperature uh, it has been given uh, just before the It has been given to a resource actually. Can we ask you to hazard uh, a guess uh, by when do you think India will be um, uh, vaccinated most adult Indians? Uh, it's like tough question for us, but uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely from a logistic perspective, we are ready. Right, uh, you're ready. What is the kind of uh, numbers that we're looking at uh, in a day? How many vaccines can you get across to the whole of India? Shall we say? we can easily move means with the current infrastructure with the current cold chain uh, uh, availability and the current tracking means the current digital solutions we have we can easily do 10 to 15 millions of vaccines in a day actually right wow and how many are you doing currently uh, maybe around 2 million okay so there's that much of capacity that's been created in the ecosystem right exactly right Right. Uh, so, Kauri, Kauri, I let let me let me clear because two million yeah. is saying they are carrying the vaccine, but we are injecting much more than that. It means there are other agencies involved in supplying this vaccines to other agencies. So we are we are giving almost four million vaccine, more than four million every day. So there must be some other supplementary or additional facility being created. Is it? It can be a direct sir. Direct movement also might be happening. So that can be one of the chances. Uh, you mean direct movement from the vaccine supplier to the uh, vaccinated? To the direct, directly pro procurement to the hospitals actually. Okay. okay. Private hospitals must be private hospitals. Right. Yeah. But right. they must. But they need the same 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 kind of equipment. Now, even the transport, everything. Yes. Uh, cold chain, everything requires the same quality, which has to be delivered to the private hospitals as well. Absolutely. So it is the same process, but might be like by doing by different people actually, different okay. places. Right. Sorry, I'll, I'll go back to because this is a very interesting subject. Exactly. And where are things? Yeah. I have not been able to figure out as a student of economics and teacher of economics. So how how what is it? What what does it, what does we include in terms of logistics? Can yeah. Can somebody explain to me when you say logistics? What does it include? 
how many items, how many institutions, how many whatever, anybody can explain to me that then we can discuss what the, where, where the lacking, where the connectivity between various, various, various things are lacking. What do you increase in logistics? Where is house, warehousing, I know there are boundary walls, there are walls and there are everything else. But logistics doesn't have a geographical or any defined architecture. So perhaps Mr. Agarwal can take that question. Yeah, sure. Um, so logistics, uh, the components of logistics, as uh, yeah. Yeah. was asking, the components is uh, basically transportation. So there could be all modes of transport, road, rail, air, sea, and even pipelines for that matter, or uh, or conveyors, as uh, Mr. Das just mentioned. These are all uh, modes of transportation. That is the bulk of uh, what constitutes logistics. Then there is warehousing costs. There is handling costs. Handling is a big part. Packaging costs, that's also a big uh, cost. Then there is inventory carrying cost, which is the cost of that inventory that's on the road or on the sea or whatever. And then there is the wastage that is there in the system, the losses that happen. So uh, broadly, these are what components of logistics, uh, as we call them uh, from a technical term. I'm not looking at the cost, I'm looking at the activities involved, the action involved. You see, from the from the ste steaming boilers to the cold chain, the supply of products and sell whatever you want to sell. There are so many activities that you have well defined that one has to take from the factory to the trucker to the mobility from one station to another, from from road to port, from from airport to again road. These are various things involved. I am I really admire all of you that yeah. during the pandemic, the supply chain was not broken to that extent yeah. as expected. India being a de developing country, I think you are the invisible heroes which have been delivered because we never felt shortage of anything. Yeah. There were short shortages, obviously, but obviously this I was trying to understand the logistics involved. Therefore, all of her were well connected. I don't know how, who was the invisible hand or power who were connecting. Because I remember I'm going to Mr. Kalsi now, a TCI with the old, must be older than me, but can't be because ever since I've started journalism, I've heard TCI name. They must be owning trucks. So many, how many trucks they own? I don't know now. But it's a famous name, household name, Transport Corporation of India. But Maruti, because I know, because invention is must in a logistic architecture. Because I remember Mr. Bachir, I don't know Mr. Kalsi remembers him or not. He was a general manager in Maruti in early 80s when he started and candidate in Mash Bhargav. When, when I was express editor at that time, he showed me a picture of a crawler. He's, I asked him, Bachir, what are you doing? He said, now I'm going to transport my Maruti car, 12 cars in one what? trawler, big trawler. Before that, India, we had never seen those kind of trucks carrying big cars in a way. So that was part of the logistic upgradation at that time. The, the similar thing must have an even TCI must have uh, done something connecting drivers and truckers so they can track it down. But you have to train them, track them, and therefore yeah. the deliveries happen. What kind of problems you faced as logistic person? In delivering your final product, I'll ask Mr. Agarwal because he's the most difficult because he's hiring so many drivers who are not trained, who are not technically savvy, but they have to be connected because tracking of a product is very important now. When it moves from one station to another, tracking is much more important. Similarly, Mr. Kalsi is applying over two lakhs cars a month or two or more than not two lakhs, one million cars are almost going there. So how they track this? What is what, what how you have made it so successful so far? And what are the difficulties you are still facing? So I think I'll take your answer question in a different manner. I think tracking is one of the things. Uh, the importance of logistics is to get up at the right product at the right place, at the right price, uh, at the right time and at the right quantity. So this is what is the objective of logistics. Now, which would mean that there are lots of things that one needs to do to ensure that uh, that, that happens, which includes the fact that there has to be a proper tracking. But notwithstanding, uh, there are a lot of challenges also, and you highlighted one of them was uh, the availability of drivers. The, um, the infrastructure in our country still requires a lot of uh, work. For example, we did a study with IM Calcutta uh, about five, six years ago, where we found that the average speed of a truck was about 38, 40 kilometers per hour. Um, so this really needs to go up. Uh, the modal mix in our country, it is 63% of our cargo moves by road today, which actually uh, results in a very high cost for the product. Whereas in a place like China, it's only about 25-30% that moves by road. 
so so again in terms of challenges there are numerous challenges from an operational perspective from a national competitiveness uh, perspective and definitely from the product uh, requirement perspective where uh, if you see something like uh, you know you'll see most cargo being handled through the head load you know people are carrying the cargo palletization in our country is very low uh, containerization is very low so these are things that will evolve and they started to evolve also uh in the last uh, decade or so that uh, that will ensure that the logistics in our country becomes more competitive there is a there is a number that the uh, world bank talks about called the lpi the logistics performance index and india is i think uh, in 2018 we were at 39 if i'm not mistaken uh, in the global rankings we have certainly moved up but we still have a long way to go Yeah, Mr. Kalsi, if you would respond. Yeah, sorry. I think uh, uh, Mr. Chawla mentioned it uh, very rightly uh, when we started our organization. You know, in fact, I am associated with this company now almost for thirty-seven years, uh, ever since we started in nineteen eighty-three. Uh, uh, so that was the time when we decided that we will deliver our cars in the factory fresh condition to our uh, uh, customers. So that's how the concept of uh, carrying cars by trucks and trailers was uh, envisaged. by our top management at that point of time and uh, since then we have been following it till then you know the cars would be produced say some uh, somewhere in the western part of the country or eastern part of the country and they'll be driven 1000 kilometers to reach their destination so that that is where we started from but having said that we have come a long way since then and uh, technology has uh, played its own uh, role in that entire process uh, today we are having a fleet of uh, uh, more than say uh, Twelve uh, thousand uh, trucks and trailers, and uh, all these uh, trucks and trailers, they are equipped with global positioning systems, and there is a central server on which the movement of uh, these uh, vehicles is monitored. And at any point of time, we can find out how many inbound uh, vehicles are coming towards the uh, plant, and how many outbound vehicles are there, and at what location they are. So this, uh, you know, gives us an assurance. Uh, about the timely delivery and also about the well-being of the vehicle as well as the drivers uh, any en route mishap happening immediately we get to know through our control room uh, that, that that is where the technology is playing a role now second thing now this during the pandemic we were able to track each and every vehicle and in case they needed help we could immediately get in touch with the driver or the supervisor there and we could provide that help and mobilize that help similarly if the trucks trailers they were stuck up somewhere we could help them that uh, which is the nearest parking spot where they can uh, go and also in case they were stuck up for want of uh, finance technology played a role again uh, through you know this thing e transfer of money we could uh, help those uh, fellows so that that's what happened during the pandemic uh, having said that this is about the vehicles likewise we were also moving our components uh, today you know we uh, have 75000 unique part numbers for our 25 models and our target is that uh, anywhere in the country a vehicle should not go off road uh, for more than say 48 hours for want of a part so we were able to meet those commitments even during the pandemic time uh, and uh, thanks to our logistics uh, partners uh, there and uh, thanks to the technology platforms that we could create in advance uh, that helped us uh, likewise uh, we have inbound logistics for our tools uh, for our raw material uh, consumables uh, for that also there was a similar kind of a tracking system uh, and uh, we were able to manage our supply chain in a very seamless manner then there were staggered uh, lockdowns at various places uh, considering the fact that our components come from all parts of the country sometimes in pune pimpri chinchwad uh, there was a lockdown and rest of the country it was not sometimes at some other location there was a lockdown so we had to manage through our proper efficient warehousing uh, uh, activities using say artificial intelligence that we manage the inventories at the right uh, place at the right uh, uh, levels and uh, during pandemic we had to review that entire process and wherever this kind of problems were there we had to create uh, small warehouses around our plant so that we uh, retain and maintain a buffer in case of any mishap or any uh, say long lockdown happens uh, at the supplier end then we are able to manage that so it was a fairly complex process but with the help of uh, 
technology uh, and uh, our uh, say efficient logistics partners we were able to manage that uh, uh, very well i would like to say so uh, mr kalshi if i could just uh, take take forward that idea so now all these you were talking about these uh, warehouses that you created the smaller warehouses now uh, in a post pandemic world in the new normal as we are discussing how will you be able to utilize or leverage uh, this extra capacity that you've created uh, how will you be able to utilize that going forward uh, well this was on a lease basis so uh, we, we did not buy real estate at that point time or created a permanent uh, you know storage uh, place so it was on a very temporary basis with the, say wafer thin uh, expenditures on that and uh, uh, now in case we don't need them we will be able to exit uh, that so that that was our understanding right mr das mentioned the idea of containers and he was saying that there's a global shortage of containers as well uh, why do we uh, is that not something that manufacturing in india can look at as an opportunity yeah definitely that's an opportunity but then there, it has its own lead time hmm. and the time is quite long and the current global manufacturers are overburdened at this point and hence we are the uh, it is in uh, short supply the basically what has happened is first it started with the economic boom and then all of a sudden this pandemic happened what has what happened was the entire con- uh, the con- uh, containers got concentrated in one region mm. and that was mostly towards china and what happened was post uh, this revival though china came back but the other parts of the world didn't hence that movement of those com- containers were still constrained in one zone right so that created this supply ch- uh, and demand imbalance which is happening and resulting into one started with container issues it resulted into vessels uh, being skipping their uh, uh, port of calls because they didn't have business and third of course these both resulted into skyrocketing skyrocketing of these freights so uh, that's i that's the situation we are in currently and i think what is happening going to happen now in the near future is uh, both one but it has to be very slow because it can't be happening overnight and one vessels will get increased second the containers will come back in the, in the system so uh, we expect that to now taper it in at least one or two quarters more is that not something you add uh, to me that uh, actually container manufacturing has started now again in india in fact the government uh, uh, shm had recommended this to the government and uh, uh, they took it up and in fact the first order was placed on a company called breathwet and bhel as well and a few other companies have now started to explore this opportunity because 95% of our containers are coming from china yes. so i think it's a it's a big opportunity as you rightly uh, mentioned uh, but yes there is a lead time surely right and uh, we were also talking about vessels uh, mr das talked about vessels is that an opportunity that india can look at or again there's a lead time there so yeah well uh, vessels is very difficult to build uh, it requires a lot of capabilities the right. shipyards in india have started doing some of that um, it's a very capex uh, intensive uh, uh, industry and it also goes through a lot of cycles so one has to be really uh, really have to think very very long term uh, i know companies like lnt etc do do that uh, so there is a, a definite potential but uh, at this point in time i, I do not see that uh, really realizing that in india to that extent as much as we can see uh, the industry established in places like korea or japan or china or even in the european countries Mr. Agarwal, may I just stay with you for a moment longer? And you know, uh, the figure that you mentioned is quite fascinating. That sixty-three percent of uh, the uh, load in India is still by road, uh, and in China, when you look at uh, it's what twenty-five percent. So uh, you know, we for so long we've heard about inland waterways, and we've been hearing that you know this will finally take off. what are the things that you feel can take the load of uh, uh, road in 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 india the one which the network is already created the capacity just needs to be channeled properly is railways <laughs> uh, we have the best amongst the best networks in the world uh, with the railways we have a lot of uh, wagons and so on so forth except they need to be 
available at the right time at the right place mm. um so uh, that's one uh, sector that can really take that burden off the roads to uh, towards rail uh and then subsequently the coastal shipping india has a massive uh, coastline Absolutely. but uh, but the development of coastal shipping has been quite weak uh, right. again in the last uh, now of course it has started uh, developing more and more uh and inland waterways is a little far out i think you know it's uh, got a lot of uh, a lot of limitations at this point um so i would think that the if the government's focus or uh, even companies focus are on these two areas the railways as well as the sea uh, coastal side we should uh, ease the burden from the roads right so um, i have yeah, yeah, to go back to industry because when i spoke to pc city when he was there in 1980 and the railway minister pandey at that time at that time i think railway was carrying much more than what road transport was carrying but it, it was the reverse i think and they told us okay we must develop the road transport therefore take off the railway but right. now we are going reverse now. <laughs> am i right mr agarwal actually no sir it was uh, railways never got to that stage but they were around the 40 50% range correct uh, 50% yeah 70 is your right yeah yeah so they wanted because the rail has not grown as much as the road transport has gone in terms of vehicle production in terms yeah. of whatever you look at it the road transport has grown faster but in a developing economy as you rightly pointed out cost of road transport is much higher than the railways and that is what is looking for therefore and the coastal we have a coastal from gujarat going up for west bengal and whatever yeah. we could have used the coastal area movement of factories are around these areas only and they could have moved from this place to and and road waterways could have been developed what i want to say now if you you are saying on the on the basis of lpi you are number 39 at the moment and we have to move up i would request all of you to give me suggestion so that we can record that what are the five different things what are the difficulty you are facing and if i have to go up what the government and all of you need at this moment that you can go up in next 5 years from 39 to somewhere else what should be the target mr kalsi or mr anybody can take that uh, i well, want all of well, you first thing is that uh, you know uh, there, there is a focus on multimodal uh, logistics and here the first thing that comes to our mind is uh, you know encouraging railways uh, uh, more than the road uh, travel because it is green number one causes less pollution uh, number two it uh, is supposed to be faster uh, because the movement has to be you know the thing uh, say seamless Uh, and uh, number three, it reduces uh, huge congestion that is occurring on our roads and uh, reduces the accidents as well. Uh, so here we have a you know this thing uh, concern that number one that uh, the speed of the cargo that travels by road is relatively much slower. Now in Japan, I have seen there are exclusive uh, uh, tracks on which the uh, goods trains go on moving without any stops and route. So from point A to B. between passenger train and goods train if we consider the goods train reaches uh, faster reaches uh, in lesser time while india the phenomena is reverse here a uh, goods train is made to stop been, even for eight hours sir mr kalti we have been talking about freight corridor for the last 20 years i think yeah. yes. Khan, yes. and mr yeah. mitab khan got to into central government because he was so known to be expert on freight corridor i don't know what happened right. to those freight corridors for which he was made the ceo i don't know whether it started or not right. anyway you are right that we have been moving very slow on the freight corridor we, we are all eagerly yeah. waiting for that sir <laughs> 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 so <laughs> and, and so you will read right after that <laughs> and, and and second thing from uh, our auto perspective i would like to say that railways have to create huge auto handling terminals yeah. uh, you know at the loading point and at the destination point uh, nevertheless the action has started in that direction and uh, we were say doing about 8% uh, vehicle transportation by uh, railway is earlier and in a span of just 3 years it is 15% and over next 3 okay. years we intend to go to 30% by uh, railways but biggest concern as of now is lack of infrastructure at the loading and destination points so that infrastructure is very important and then of course the speed uh, second point is about say alternate system of uh, say waterways Uh, now waterways again similar problem of infrastructure comes uh, then the dredging of the rivers is very important uh, the ships which uh, will be deployed they may not get that kind of a raft there mm. that kind of say water depth that's another problem and then loading unloading points again 
we okay. would need uh, infrastructure uh, to park the vehicles in a safe manner and also to unload the vehicles and again uh, say safety of the vehicles will be very important in those areas uh, likewise say we have a huge coastline uh, now if the manufacturing plants are uh, say located along the coastline then from say one side to another side that movement may be possible but again it has to be supported by say proper infrastructure now think of a situation of a company like maruti where we produce the plant, you know vehicles at uh, gurgaon now suppose we take it to the port so that has to be by road and then again we have to do unloading again loading then at the destination point loading unloading then last mile again by road so the handling of the vehicles at so many places leads to problems you know some dents some gujarat now you are going to near the port in gujarat now yes yes so once that comes certainly things would be you know the thing maybe little more smooth uh, but these these are some of the challenges uh, likewise we have to make our uh, road transport more user friendly today uh, the drivers when they uh, you know take the cargoes take the vehicles or components they are the most harassed lot on the road right they are harassed at the borders they are harassed en route uh, by various enforcing uh, agencies so even if everything is uh, you know uh, say uh they are, they are meeting all the requirements still you know uh, inspectorate finds some problem or the other to you know this thing uh, put heavy penalties on them then cross border movement from state to state there are delays vehicles are held up there uh, different states have different entry taxes uh, which are you know causing problems now when we, when we travel in europe we don't even get to know when we move from one country to another country now here within our own country we are stop you know at every state border uh and uh, th- there are problems you know more, more such uh, say uh, uh borders or barriers are created more would be the say scope for corruption more will be the scope for say harassment of the say users of uh, the road so we have to look into all all those things government of india is certainly taking initiatives say fast tag i would like to say has definitely helped it has enhanced the uh, you know capacity or, or, or the efficiency of the fleet earlier our trucks were moving say around 300 kilometers a day today they can move move 450 kilometers a day so technology solutions certainly are helping but we have a long way to go to have that seamless movement that a truck starts from kashmir right up to kanyakumari it goes undisturbed uh, up to its destination so we are we are waiting for that day so these are some of the you know areas where we need to improve a lot and uh, we we have a long way to go uh, that, that's my view point on this we have not spoken to car- cargo exchange because that's the yes. best people to tell us <laughs> mr <laughs> ichan what to yeah. be done yeah <laughs> so basically sir uh, see uh, we we from the technology perspective right so we always talk saying that uh, let's say container shortage is there so one way is to, to building the capacity of the container so that is like uh, done by the heavy lifters but from a technology perspective if we can have a visibility solution something like which car exchange runs is a ca- empty container visibility marketplace where people can even understand where the containers are lying today and they can actually if required the repositioning can also be done with their containers right same way like it's all about the visibility where the trucks are where the supply is and where the demand is how do we match the demand and supply so that we get a better solution better output of that right at the same time uh, certain recommendations for the optimal uh, model mix let's say when a cargo moves by road and uh, the same cargo can also be moved by uh, coastal coastal shipping right uh, and maybe it may be higher, uh, 30% more cheaper than by moving by coastal shipping but a lot of people doesn't know means the comparison factor the free benchmarking has to be done with respect to coastal shipping versus by road versus by rail uh, so that people can even understand saying that what is the time taken and what is the cost and then they can they decide saying that maybe i am moving tires today so that is my coastal shipping might be much appropriate for me because they are not going to uh, ha- nothing is going to happen to my tires after e- even if it reaches after one month actually but at the same time if my is an fmcg products and i need to move it so there may be by road may be the better solution for that particular thing so that kind of solutions analytical tools performance monitoring tools has to come up and uh, and we are sitting on a huge set of data so that is very important right lot of data is there across india with different players and it is being worked out in silo section if we can integrate this data bring it together and uh, showcase to the entire industry we can definitely move our lpi index uh, into a single digit 
as soon as fast action. So that's that's uh, our idea. Mr. Dar, so what are your what are your power. expectations? How to go up in the LPI? <laughs> so I think, uh, sir, uh, both the things Mr. Kalsi actually explained it very nicely. So yes, multimodal. I will touch upon that, and then what additional I feel is I will say that is. in multimodal we have been talking about multi component has to be there we, and there are some inter- infrastructure being created all that is fine what we should also enable is multimodal for various different type of c- categories of commodities and for irrespective of whether it is moving domestic or international so there are different benchmarks which are available across the uh, world how it is done like uh, when we need mentioned it is 63% as of now as in road ideally if you ask me they should the needle should be on the other side for india it should be 63% on the railway side that's the ideal for us kind of our kind of a uh, industry where we are heavily dependent on railways we look at that as a goal to move towards that as a index currently as we speak we are around 50% which is not bad per se but that has happened over Two three years of last pandemic, where we didn't have a choice, and we were forced to think it that way, and we pushed railways as well to give us those uh, incentives and benefits to move around those places. So I think that incentivization is very important. How do you make a person utilize that space in terms of that mode? Second is was on digitization. Mr. Kalsi mentioned about the road part on uh, the fast tag. Yes, the fast tag was a the fabulous uh, i would say uh, uh, but now it has to be taken ahead i feel we should you try and utilize this how we can imbibe all the documents into a fast tag today we are only utilizing for the tolls how you can add on documents to it how can that one single solution be a part of the entire journey for the truck driver is that possible i think that possible the last point yeah last point is on uh, Uh, on the shipping side like uh, shehari mentioned about uh, the containerization and the digitization which is available there i feel the documentation is huge on the shipping side on the exim side of our uh, logistics that needs to be brought to the blockchain something has to be thought about it we have to cursively do something about it because during the pandemic it was huge problem to ensure documents move forget Uh, products the documents which had to move through banks or somewhere it was really a problem so it's high time that we think and enable those technologies for users to u- utilize those right sir so, so, i have a question so we have recently, no, sorry go ahead please so i just wanted to tell mr das singh that we have recently launched uh, the secure logistic document exchange platform along with ministry of commerce logistic division uh, this is about uh, uh, it's a blockchain enabled platform where all logistic related documents can be exchanged on it it includes banks it may include logistic service users providers uh, we also have like a integration with customs ipa so that all stakeholders can get all the documents at one place it will manage the title of ownership and also it will manage the authenticity of the documents also so that's what i want to excellent is it an operation or does it ha- uh, is it yet to be uh, so last friday we, it was launched as a beta version for testing to the all the stakeholders so pocs was done with uh, uh, all the national and international banks actually and also with few of the uh, uh, ser- logistic service users and also providers when can we see this fully operational uh means so, everyone should be able to cover it should be able to answer but, uh, that so, poc has to be uh, means once the beta testing and the feedback comes from the industry it depends upon how do we actually launch it Thank right you. Mr. Agarwal will be able to tell us uh, whether it is coming up, and he must have told us yeah. whether it is working or not. Documentation is a big thing because Mr. Kalsi was mentioning that we move from one state to another. Yeah, that's right. Documents. I don't know how GST helped or not in this reducing this kind of harassment. Or later, or too many chungis or too many things are happening. Mr. Agarwal, tell us whether this what he's talking about it is irrigation, but it will not help documentation. One is the privacy of the data, of course, competitive word. It is not stolen or whatever. What has happened? But is it happening? Have you tested it? Yes, absolutely. And I think uh, what uh, Shiari mentioned over here is that uh, 
it's a uh, lot of work has already happened on that let's see uh, as you rightly mentioned about gst i think that was one of the uh, ways that things started formalizing in our uh, economy uh, more forcefully and uh, that's where the digitization of documentation also started uh, the journey with e way bills and now e invoicing and now the requirement that all all documentation has to be electronic will mean that ultimately it should not be on anyone's discretion to stop the truck there has to be a reason and if you have to stop the truck uh, nowadays we are seeing they are they have they actually scanning the truck number and checking acha what are you carrying we know what you are carrying now so it's becoming quite formal but we it is it has to be uh, adapted and adopted nationally and that's a process that's obviously with something like this takes a little longer time um gsc itself as you know is a very very complex subject and there are people who are trying to either one side claim too many too much gst and one side not pay any gst <laughs> so so you have to uh, uh there are all kinds of players in our country so we have to keep that balancing act uh, and get this uh, activated as soon as possible uh, for the formalization of the economy uh there's a comment from vikas sapte to everyone i'd just like to read uh, that out edfc and wdfc are progressing improving and have contributed greatly to major increase in freight movement during the pandemic once completed in totality this will surely change the way the logistics business will be done in the future and the horizon is near by 2023 his other comment is that blockchain technology for document management and control is amazing to hear this will surely improve things uh, you know any any comments on uh, the first comment on uh, edfc and wdfc and how it's progressing the sagar one i think um, uh, mr kalsi also mentioned uh, that the the dfc the dedicated freight corridor on the eastern side and the western side uh, it started uh, some operations have started already on it so very hopeful that this will be a game changing uh, uh, thing for the logistics industry mr chavla uh, uh, are you happy to hear that <laughs> <laughs> my experience you know they won't say but i my experience is okay let us see hum have started so let us start <laughs> so i won't comment it anything else but i just want to look at the various things they were talking about railway and what not what don't you think that privatization of railway particularly for the freight freight part of it will be helpful in improving your standing in the world in terms of movement of goods uh, to some extent i think privatization is one of the areas but um, it's also very uh, capex heavy so government front loads certain types of uh, capex uh, will help uh, to build the infrastructure base infrastructure and then of course privatize so the talks around the dfc also about uh, certain private trains running etc is all all going to happen so so yes we are moving in the right direction uh, as you rightly said they, it needs to be executed um, so we yeah. know that one section from rewadi to palanpur is already active and the rest of the other sections are under construction and uh, 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 again uh, i think uh, in our country uh, we have to have hope and we have to be very very optimistic uh, uh, if you are looking at the challenges that we have Right. one thing which we have not spoken much ka very so we spent couple of minutes on that now yeah. we don't have enough time warehousing for example hmm. cold chains are there of course cold chains is how many cold chains in terms of you what we need for the country how much is available or not we don't know but in terms of warehousing also we are shortages are there because warehousing earlier was only to keep the food grains which were eaten away by the rats later on i have done the stories on food corridors in india warehousing right. so what do you suggest because logistics and warehousing go together unless you have break in point where the break of the goods and service you carry somewhere store somewhere then move there from there what do you think should be done to increase the warehousing policy because it involves it is state subject center subject central warehousing corporation you don't know what is happening to that so you don't know what is happening to food corporation in india warehouses are they utilized or not what do you think how can we organize better warehousing throughout the country and you have seamless the movement of goods my two cents on this sir is that i think the industry is changing very rapidly and uh, we are seeing huge amount of uh, development and development of modern warehouses 
specifically because companies in the e-commerce space sector have pushed yeah, they are, a they lot are. of change uh, so so i think it's a it's a sunrise sector and a lot of investment global investment is coming into this area so i'm uh, it is a, a, a big change that you are see, you are seeing and i think the fci kind of warehouses are also evolving to silos in many places uh, so that uh, and at the port level we see a lot of storage available both for chemical kind of logistics uh, chemical storage uh, so we have to look at warehousing not just from a go down but from something that stores something uh, and that could be a chemical that could be a food grain that could be a e-commerce item that could be an fmcg item so so that the whole evolution of this industry is uh, has started and uh, is is actually rapidly picking up itchanapu would you like to uh, uh, jump in on this rain on this my two cents are here uh, like uh, see again the aggregation of data has to happen with respect to warehouses right a lot of warehouses are empty in one side of the country and a lot of warehouses are available uh, on the other side means uh, the demand and supply mismatch is still there actually right. and uh, i know that because mm-hmm. most of the warehousing which, which is e-commerce companies are hiring they are hiring around the metro so the exactly. big warehouses are coming so in gurgaon and near bombay they are not anywhere in the rural areas of such dot places because they, they, they are also going by the demand where the demand is and they can move the services right. equitable distribution of logistic and warehouses is also required in india i think we need to move closer to the usage points so from centralized warehousing to say decentralized where the actual use is so that is very important and we have to move beyond these you know major say 10 to 12 cities go closer to say tier 2 tier 3 cities and uh, uh, it will also uh, not only you know Uh, say speed up the time of uh, response uh, it will also lead to efficient management of those uh, stores and uh, also the land prices would be much uh, cheaper there uh, uh, while in the you know bigger city land prices are very very high and uh, then suppose we are producing say uh, vegetables fruits then cold chains can be closer to those uh, farms where they produce it store it and then go on distributing it uh, uh, as and when required so that kind of a model i think uh, hub and spoke model uh, on warehousing is uh, very important moving forward i think i think we had a most uh, uh, entertaining and enlightening discussion and really it's uh, quite remarkable how all four of you gave us such a wonderful perspective on how india moves in a way and how india should move forward uh, so thank you gentlemen for being with us and all the very best uh, uh you know you're also the silent heroes of uh, this uh, pandemic and going forward in the new normal i hope a lot more attention is paid to uh, this uh, area thank you mr agarwal thank you mr das thank you mr sriyari thank you mr kalsi thank, thank you mr you. chawla thank you very much thank you thank, thank you all of you thank, thank, thank you thank you so much thank you bye